Learning Objective 1-2. Don't worry, we're going to get out of the PowerPoints in a little while. I, I don't really like teaching with PowerPoints. Um, and these, I, I have to cuss, change them around a little bit to cover what I really want to cover. But um, especially in this chapter and some of the later chapters, they, they really help. I, I, you'll see later on, we're going to have a lot of Excel and I'll show you how to do things rather than just going over different rules. But um, I want to cover all of this content so that you have it because there is a lot of CPA questions built in here. Learning Objective 1-2, understand the development of standards related to acquisition accounting over time. When I took this class in, I think, 1988, there were two ways of accounting for business acquisitions. One was purchase and the other was pooling. And the way they were commonly referred to, purchase was called acquisitions and poolings was called mergers. Um, and the way the way it worked was that if you met 12 criteria, there were 12 criteria for pooling. And if you met all 12 of these criteria, then you could use pooling. You had to use pooling accounting. And if you missed any one of the 12, then you had to use purchase. And so naturally what would happen was that companies like pooling for the reason that I'll explain in a few minutes. Companies like pooling. So what they would do is investment bankers would structure the acquisition so that the criteria for pooling was met if they could. And if they couldn't do it, then they would have to use purchase, which they didn't like. But companies always wanted to use pooling if they could, you know, provided that they could. Now, what was so great about pooling? The way pooling worked was that you would take the books of the two companies, the parent and the sub, and you would combine them as if they had been operating as one company all along. So you would actually combine previous years and you would not write up any assets. In essence, if there was any value given from one company to the other, it was sort of smoothed over. And instead, you simply took the two companies and you presented them as if they had always been one company. And again, that would mean combining previous year's financial statements and not writing anything up. There was no goodwill. And this was very popular. The FASB hated it because the FASB felt that in substance, one company is really buying another and the assets should be written up. And companies did not want to write up the assets. CSS company managers loved it. They loved pooling. And the FASB hated this. They wanted to eliminate it really badly and they made a great compromise. But wait, why wouldn't companies want to write up their assets and why wouldn't they want to record goodwill? Right, we, we always want it. we want more valuable assets, right? And goodwill is a good thing. Why wouldn't we want to do that? Because the reality is that, and I'm sorry to share this bad news with you, but assets are future expenses. I know it sounds pretty bad, um, but that's reality, that when you think about it, almost every asset on a balance sheet is eventually going to hit the income statement and it's going to lower your profits. Inventory becomes cost of goods sold. Buildings and equipment gets depreciated. That's depreciation expense. And goodwill, under the old pooling rules, had to be amortized over not more than 40 years, or as we like to say, 40 years or less. So goodwill had to be amortized. And if you had a lot of goodwill, then you had a lot of amortization expense, and that would drag down your earnings. So companies didn't want to really write up their assets because, and we're going to come back to this over and over again, assets are future expenses. Some assets are not. You think about it, right? Investments, right? If you buy an investment, then you're going to sell it probably at a profit, right? So it's not going to lower your weight. But the more you pay, the lower your gain. So the more that that asset is on your books for, the less the gain that you're going to record, or the greater the loss when you go ahead and sell it. So this is almost, with the exception of cash, right? Almost every single asset you can think of is eventually going to be an expense. Um, you have impairments too, right? When you record the expense sooner. So it's going to be recorded sooner. It's going to be recorded later. But sooner or later, that asset is going to lower your income. And this is, this is axiomatic. So companies didn't want to write up things up because they would have to record less income later. There was a poster child for this. It was Time Warner. Time Life was a magazine publishing and book company. And they bought Warner Brothers Pictures. 
It was one of the biggest merge, biggest mergers of all time. And um, there was a big hostile battle to take over Warner Brothers at the time. And the price of Warner Brothers was bid up way high. Time paid a lot of money to buy Warner Brothers. They used acquisition accounting and they recorded a tremendous amount of goodwill. How much goodwill did they record? They recorded so much goodwill that after the merger, they didn't figure this out. No one noticed this before the merger. I don't know what they were doing all day, but no one noticed this before the merger. They noticed it after the merger. After the merger, they realized that the goodwill was going to be so high that goodwill amortization would be so high that the company was, could not possibly be profitable in the next 40 years. It was, they, now, where does goodwill come from? It comes from paying a lot of money for the investment. They paid so much money for the investment that there was no way that, the, and the goodwill amortization was so high that there was no way this company was going to be profitable in the next 40 years. And so that should tell you something, right? They probably shouldn't have done the merger, um, but they did the merger. Uh, they probably shouldn't have done it in the first place. They were just paying too much money. If you're never going to be profitable as a merged company, then maybe you shouldn't do the merger. But they did the merger anyway, okay? So managers did not want to do this goodwill amortization anymore. And pooling was a way out of it. Because if they could qualify for pooling, then it didn't really matter how much stock they gave up for the acquisition. Usually they pooling mergers were stock for stock acquisitions. They didn't have to write up the goodwill, and therefore they didn't have to worry about this, and they could earn more profit. They could report more profit later on in the future. So the FASB forged a great compromise. And the great compromise was no more pooling, but this was FASB 140 and 141. No more pooling, but you don't have to amortize goodwill anymore. Everybody has to use acquisition accounting. You have to record goodwill. You have to write up your assets. But you don't have to amortize goodwill anymore. And However, you're going to need to test goodwill for impairment. And this was the same time, I think it's FASB 141, where FASB tightened up the rules for goodwill impairment. And the concern there was that companies would be recording too much goodwill. It would be on the books of these astronomical amounts and that it would need to be written down. So pooling of interest was eliminated, and we wound up with just one method, which the FASB has revised and um, made some revisions to over time, called the acquisition method. And now all acquisitions need to be recorded using the acquisition method. It's um, ASC section 805. And the acquirer is going to buy the company based on the fair value of the whatever it's given up and the fair value of a non-controlling interest, which we'll be talking about. And goodwill does not need to be amortized. Now, why is pooling relevant today? Because companies that were used pooling back when it was allowed, mergers that were affected under pooling still use pooling because that was allowed at the time. And if they're still merged, they still have pooling and they have these assets that would date back, that were not written up during the merger, but their book values would date back to before the merger. I doubt you'd see many of these in practice, but it's important to know. It's also really interesting how the accounting for this evolved. So to qualify for acquisition accounting treatment, A, one company must acquire common stock of the other combining company. B, a statutory consolidation must occur, whatever that is. C, each company must be approximately the same size. D, a stock for stock exchange must occur, or E, none of the above. So, A, one company must acquire common stock of the other company. Um, I don't actually. I'm not even. I guess you could have a. I don't know. I think it says here it's. E, but I, I don't know why one company does have to buy. I guess what you could do is you, it, the answer is E, because you could have the two companies being merged into one single company. As we said before, you could have a merger where 
you have a new company and the two old companies get bought by the new one. In acquisition accounting, common stock must be the consideration given. Goodwill is not reported. A statutory merger occurs. A change of basis in accounting occurs or E, none of the above. And the answer is D, a change in basis of accounting occurs. In other words, what you're going to do is when you do the acquisition, you're going to write up all of your assets to fair market value, all the assets of the subsidiary to fair market value. And you're also going to record, um, you're also going to record goodwill if it's relevant. 